water control keep you watch on the water. 4,000 of New York's finest looking out in the crowd. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Independence Day. It is July 4th. Security is super tight throughout the city, so you're prepared to celebrate the 4th. Joining NYC Air Patrol in the sky today, military jet. Yeah. The message this morning from the mayor is the same as it's been all week. Enjoy the 4th. We're probably as prepared as you could possibly be. In the new war against America, everything is now a target. Possible to ensure their safety. Its greatest icons, even its most cherished holidays. A terrorist attack is likely. Tonight's festivities will be heavily guarded with checkpoints all along the FDR and all major crossings into Manhattan. There's also a large police presence on the waterways. It's July 4th, the first Independence Day celebration since 9-11 and America's biggest city is under siege. There have been a variety of reports coming in, intelligence reports, that suggest we ought to be uh, especially vigilant as we go into the 4th of July season. Yes, it is a time for enhanced vigilance, and we would ask the help of the American people in that way. Independence Day represents everything the United States stands for. But this year, as the festivities ratchet up, so does the fear. The FBI has warned of potential attacks on parades. In New York City, they've all been cancelled, except this one. Staten Island's July 4th parade is the oldest in the country and organisers refuse to be cowed. But they do not refuse the extra security, especially for special guests. Do you have a press pass? Hello? Where's his press pass? Tension is also high on the other side of town. When the planes hit on 9-11, Fireman Pat Kelly was among the first to reach the World Trade Center. Pat was the only fireman on his rig to survive. Seven guys from this squad never came back. It was a big hit. In a way, we were lucky that we were so busy afterwards. Uh, I think it would have hit us uh, a lot harder. But being so busy, it helped ease back into somewhat normalcy. Um, uh, are we going to forget about it? No. The commander of Pat's Lower Manhattan Fire Squad is Lieutenant Brian Smith. It was devastating. The seven guys we lost were extremely talented men. I mean, they were handpicked to come here um, when we were established in 1998. I know over 100 people, 100 firefighters I knew personally, probably 50 of them were good friends and the closest of the seven that I worked with here. A year ago, the deaths of his men had Brian boiling with rage. He told us then he wanted the hijackers caught and tortured. Has time healed the hurt? Emotions go back and forth. Uh, sometimes I feel that we should use one of our nuclear weapons that are sitting in the silo somewhere and turn, you know, part of the Middle East into the glass. Sometimes you go from that emotion to, you know, sitting back and thinking logically. Of course, you'd kill many, you know, thousands of innocent people. You would think that we'd be above that, especially going through it. One year on, and New York is still going through it. Ground Zero has been cleared of its seven-storey pile of rubble and transformed into a nearly deserted construction site ready for rebirth. But for many, this is now much more than just a prized piece of real estate. At Ground Zero today, most of the digging and bulldozing has stopped, 
that there is still much work to be done. For those who knew the 1,200 people whose bodies have not been recovered, this is hallowed ground and will always be a graveyard. One year after the September 11th attacks, New Yorkers and the friends and relatives of those who died here are being told to move on. But for many of them, that is proving impossible. I thought it would be, um, you know, as time went on, it would get, it would be uh, better. But um, I find that it's, it's gotten, you know, it's gotten, it's, it's actually gotten, you know, worse. Gabriel de la Pena lost his wife Emerita in the World Trade Center attacks. Emerita worked for a finance company on the 90th floor of the South Tower with her best friend Judy. We last spoke to Gabriel just days after the disaster. He was preparing for his daughter's first birthday and holding out hope that Emerita would still be alive to celebrate it with them. Since then, he's struggled to piece together the last minutes of his wife's life. Gabriel now knows that as the plane hit, Emerita was speaking on the phone to a friend. That morning, uh, I think around 20 to 9, he had st started talking to my wife, and my wife was telling her him about the preparations we were making for uh, my daughter's first birthday. And um, a couple of minutes later, there was a loud um, noise, and one of her girlfriends came over and said, that there had been an explosion upstairs and for them to run out to go. It's tough because I wasn't there. So the little bits and pieces that I hear and that, that people tell me, it's like re trying to recreate a story, but a story that means a lot to you. Usually when somebody dies, you uh, receive a body. If a person dies in a car crash, for example, you get a body back, you get the bury, you get a plot, you go grieve at that plot. They never found my wife's body. so. I can't go somewhere and pray over a plot, you know. I can't go take a flowers, you know. Is that something you feel you could do at the site? No. I've only been to the site three times the most since, uh, since last September. I was there that day. I, I, I saw some of the stuff that happened. I, I too had to run from that. Um, so it, it's, it's just like um, I, I try to stay away from the site, you know. It's, it just brings back too many um, bad feelings, bad memories. It's much the same for Monica Eichen, but she forces herself to come to Ground Zero. This is where she feels closest to her husband, Michael. This is the only place where we actually feel connected. And every time, no matter what, I feel this energy and it's like, he's here. It's like, this is where they are. And we need to acknowledge that and honor that. Michael Eichen was on the 84th floor of the same tower as Emerita de la Pena, and like Emerita, Mike's body has never been found. It's very hard to say goodbye to a picture and to acknowledge that someone went to work one day, said, I'll see you later, I love you, and then never came home. So it's like he went poof one day, and where is he? So every time I come here, I'm always like, where are you? I know you're here somewhere, where are you? In Michael's memory, Monica now heads a group fighting to ensure that a fitting memorial is built at Ground Zero for the 2,800 who died here. Without it, like Gabriel, she won't be able to move on. There's not closure for us. There isn't going to be any closure, because every day as I said, we see 9-11, I see buildings falling down, and I, I see in my mind people suffering the most horrific deaths possible. I mean, some of these people suffered so horribly. We have to heal, and in order for us to heal, we have to have a place to go. I didn't choose this for my cemetery, and I know my husband didn't either. But this is the reality, and the reality is this is the only place we have. But this is New York. And there are those who simply want the site restored to what it was, a key commercial property. I don't want any granite statue to people that got killed. We know they died. It was a terrible thing. It hurt very much. Fine. Now, go to work. That's the name of the city of New York as a place where people work. Tabloid columnist Jimmy Breslin 
is the veteran voice of New York's tough working class. You look out the, out the window here, you see the Queensboro Bridge, the lights flashing as they're coming in to start work. That's this city. This city isn't a park where people grieve. No. Well, it is our cemetery. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to put tombstones on it, but it is a cemetery and we have to acknowledge that because if we lose sight of that, then we lose sight of the loved ones we've lost who are still here. Their, their souls are here. This is their final resting place. I live in the city of New York. I have just as much right as she does, and I don't want a memorial. Jeweler Joel Coppel represents the middle ground, those who want to respect the dead but also need to make a living. Last September 11th, he was scooping up jewels from his store's display as fast as he could. All right, see you later. Bye. Upstairs, his wife Renee was doing the same thing. A block away, the World Trade Center had just been struck and they were desperately trying to get the store closed. When we talked to them a few days after the disaster, their shop had been looted and they were trying hard to get back on their feet. One year later, they still are. I think there isn't a day that goes by where people can't think about what had happened that day. So I don't know if it's more of a somber feeling or maybe it's a little bit more somber in lower Manhattan, but it's definitely, I think, on everybody's minds um, and what the next step could possibly be as far as terrorism. The Coppels estimate 180,000 people a day used to pass through the World Trade Center. Their absence means business across lower Manhattan is down by 40%. They believe the best way to honour the victims is to build big towers that will help business bounce back. They made money, they bought money, they sold money, they traded money, and they're capitalists. And I think it would, they wouldn't want an entire memorial to take up 16 acres because I think they would feel in their heart that we gave in. My feeling was maybe something on a 50-50, half of it of some beautiful, long-lasting tribute and memorial, and the other half, even if it became some form of commercial space, is still a memorial to those people. Well, you know, it would be really nice to have the whole site be a memorial park. Is that reality? Not. That is not reality. So if that's not the reality, then we need to do it correctly. We, make, we have to make sure that we do it right. Um, I think that, you know, the key is to heal. And the only way that we're going to be able to heal, because every day for us is 9-11, is to know that we have a beautiful place to go to honor our loved ones in the most respectful, dignified way possible. With such difficult competing interests, getting it right is what this meeting is all about. Hopefully what we do here today will be one more step on the long road of healing. Today, 5,000 New Yorkers have gathered in downtown Manhattan to confront the delicate challenge of what should replace the fallen towers. We will take a lot of steps. But it's a delicate debate. Business wants to rebuild exactly the same amount of commercial floor space that was in the World Trade Center, while the relatives want a large open space where they can go and grieve in peace. In an hour, the city's six new design options will be unveiled. I am uh, Monica Eichen. I lost my husband, Michael, Tower 2. And I started a foundation called September's Mission, where all I focus on is on the memorial. It's times like these that Monica feels her loss most sharply. Exactly. But the hopes of other relatives have steeled her determination not to be pushed aside by real estate agents, business or even the organisers of this meeting, who fear her influence enough to try and stop us filming. Excuse me, we can't do this. If this is going to happen, and I'm going to try to make it not, we can't do it. This is exactly what the organisers don't want. i got to stop this, because this is exactly what they don't want. Monica isn't the only one who knows the pressure is on today. 
To help set the stage for this discussion... Bob like Yarrow is an influential city planner. He believes the debate over what to do with the site is central to New York's healing. ...affected by 9-11. Everybody in the world saw it on television, but most New Yorkers saw it in person, and it's a devastating thing to see it happen to your city. So we've all gone through that. We all need to, you know, to restore our sense of well-being and the city's sense of well-being. If you put the first plan up, I'm going to talk to you about the plans. Finally, the moment everyone's waited for has arrived, the unveiling of the government's options. Um, it does build on the footprints and it treats the memorial space quite differently. They have the right names, Memorial Square, Memorial Promenade, Memorial Park, but they lack the soaring statement many seek. They've been designed like this for one reason, to retain exactly the same rentable floor space as before. Big business, it seems, has won, and the relatives of the dead are devastated. But it doesn't seem like they really care about what the family members want. As you can see from these plans, nothing that Monica Eichen of September's mission has worked for for the last several months seems to be incorporated into any of these plans. And why is it called Memorial when the memorial aspect is the smallest part of what they're building here? It should be commercial promenade, commercial park, retail space. I want to be able to go in there and not have to be watching me as I pay respects to my husband and you do the same. I mean, we need that. So this is what I've heard so far. Not enough space for Memorial Park. Don't like the fact that it's a transit hub. And you feel that the process has been rushed to choose. It will take months for a final decision. But despite the differences, Bob Yarrow still believes a compromise is possible. There's a middle ground, and I think most people are in the middle, suggesting that what we really need is to have a dynamic new area of the city that does honor to people who died, but that also sets new standards in urban design and environmental design and transportation and so forth. Is it a little wabbit? No, oh, these are little bears. It looks like little bears, right? Uh. Yeah. Who's that? Me. Who's that? Me. What's finally built at the World Trade Center site won't be 9-11's only legacy. Uh. It's a fuzzy bunny, right? 10,000 children lost a parent. One of them was Daniela de la Pena. Now, Gabrielle's mother has become Daniela's as well. And even though they repeat Emerita's name, they are yet to explain to Daniela why her mum has never come home. Who's that, Daniela? Mommy. That's mommy, right? What's mommy's name? Mommy. It's not so much explanation now because she's young, at such a young age that she doesn't understand what really happened. But when she gets older, I mean, uh, I mean, I'll tell her. I mean, you know, she'll see, she'll see it on TV. She'll read about it, and I'll, and I'll tell her that her mother was involved in this, and this is how her mother died. Who's the most beautiful girl in the house? Me. <laughs> My future is seeing that Daniela gets raised as a young, beautiful, respectable lady. That's my future. Who's this? Seeing that Daniela, uh, you know, gets to be what she wants to be. Back at the fire station, it's been a quiet day. But these guys, more than most, are the new frontline defenders of their city. Squad 18 is a hazardous materials unit. If there is a biological, chemical or nuclear terrorist attack, these men will be the first to face it. And they know that attack could come at any time. You get an explosion, is it a dirty bomb? Does it have chemical in it as well? Does it have radiological? That's a big worry right now. Got a call? As we speak, Pat's called out. This one turns out to be a false alarm, but Pat has no doubt that one day he'll be racing to another 9-11. Is it more likely than it was before? I would say yes. Something's going to happen. Um, what scope, what it's going to be, uh, you know. You always have to think of a worst case scenario. 
What are you going to do? I live in the city of New York. I'm not going to leave. And I'm not going to spend my life under the bed or in the closet. I'm going to lead a normal life. If something happens, so be it. That's it. I don't have a fear anymore. I'm ready to go. I mean, it doesn't even phase me because I know that I have the best angel waiting for me. And, and most of the families feel that way. We don't have a fear anymore. For some, the fear may be gone, but New York, like America, has had its sense of security shattered. For New York, the patriotic hoopla of this July 4th was an attempt to heal the hurt and get back to business. For many in this city, it's the only way they can fight back in a new war that has made them the target. <laughs>